into the inner verse. Welcome, everybody, to the pre-intro before the intro to this podcast episode. It's kind of a different one, and that's why I'm coming out in front of it to explain that the conversation you're about to hear between myself and Dylan Sicoccio and our honored guest, Jan Ott, is something of a connoisseur's conversation. The minutia and the details that we're going to be exploring in this podcast are potentially not going to resonate as well if you're not familiar with the Oralinda in any regard. I'm not saying it won't resonate. It's still going to be interesting. But to remedy that, after we had this talk, I went ahead and did a vibrant about the Oralinda where we introduced the topics involved in a more comprehensive way. So if you didn't catch that, it's from last Wednesday, if you're hearing this on the day that it comes out, or just go look for vibrant episode 102 pretty recent, then please go check that out so that you have comprehension of the conversation that's to follow here. It will make things more interesting. That was a great vibrant episode. I know you'll love it. And then another thing about this episode that is a little different is because of the time that we recorded the conversation, I had not done as much research about the Orlinda or read very much of it yet, but Dylan had. Dylan takes the reins in many of the topics and the steering that we do here. And it is great. I liked being able to give him a place to have questions and answers and share his own observations with a really legendary researcher like Jan, who is a particularly impressive because he's not even a native English speaker. To be able to give an interview in a language that is not your first language, bravo. I think that's awesome. So with all that said, I'd like you to enjoy the conversation that's about to follow. We're not going to do any first hour, second hour stuff. This one's all going out to everybody because I think it's important and I know you'll enjoy that. So thanks. And if you want to support, even though there's not a second hour that's behind a paywall, you know what to do. Super chat or check the episode description for links to ways that you can support the show. Typical new herbs is a good way to do that. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse podcast. I'm your host Chance with a special appearance co-host wingman Dylan Sicoccio. You know him, you love him. This is a very special interview with Jan Ott, a researcher about the Aura Linda, a highly controversial text that we're going to get into describing you've probably never heard of, maybe one of the more repressed repressed <laughs> things in this space of syncretic research. It demonstrates a possible huge link between language and practices of the uh, ancient universal empire or system of religion that Dylan has done so much to bring forward into our awareness, but I'm not going to do too much introducing. I want to just get right into it. So welcome to the show, Jan Ott and Dylan. How are you guys doing? Awesome. And I just want to let everyone know, I've been getting asked about the world, Linda, for about a year now on almost every podcast I do. Oh, do you have um, that thing I sent you queued up by any chance? It's okay. No, no, I didn't grab that. I didn't. Hold on. Let, let me, let, let me show you this. This is so great. This is the last big podcast I did, right? I see a good comment here. Elm Tree, Orlando. That's another, that's a whole. 
<laughs> you can hear that, right? Yeah. Uh, you were on Old World Florida and yep. the Oralinda came up there. Yep. And it's a podcast unto itself. And now we are starting that. It's probably going to be more than one time that we talk about this. But Jan, could you introduce yourself and your work with the Oralinda? Hello, Charles and Dylan. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, you mean like a general introduction? Yes, please. Yeah, for people who have never let me, heard Let me hype them up a little bit. So Jan uh, is one of the best researchers in the world, bar none, probably the foremost expert on the Orlinda. And I've been looking into this. And the reason I reached out to him is because, and the reason I followed him is because he goes out there in the real world. He does lectures in his real name. He goes in person against other scholars, whatever, who are going to be in the audience. So his work is up for scrutiny and he's not sensational and he's very careful about making claims and he's like an absolute professional. So I always like to associate with the best of the best and he is the best of the best in my opinion, which is why we invited him here. So for the audience, you can find him at his foundation is oralinda.org. That's O-E-R-A-L-I-N-D-A.org. We'll be in the chat posting this when it goes live. And then he also is on YouTube at Oralinda, O-E-R-A-L-I-N-D-A. Yes, thank you. That's generous. Um, yeah, I also have the luxury that I um, don't have to live from uh, this work. Um, so that's why I, not, uh, I can... Um, there's no one telling me what I, what I should do or what I should not do. Um, yeah, and to, to give a general introduction quickly, usually I don't like to repeat myself. So what I've said in earlier presentations or uh, interviews, um, um, people may want to start with that. But uh, real quickly, the Ura Linda is a manuscript that, is, um, that became known in the 1870s. Someone had it in his possession uh, from, a family from a family inheritance. He had tried to read it. He wasn't. He hadn't been uh, initiated into the secrets of it, which he should have been. Um, it's a very different story about how he got it. But when he was older and he uh, wanted to know the contents, he, he was um, given the idea to uh, to have it studied by a, by a foundation for uh, Frisian language and history. And it turned out to be texts um, pre-Christian with two letters of instruction uh, from a culture that had been uh, not only in uh, the Netherlands and Friesland, but um, with colonies in the Med Mediterranean and even in Northwest India. Um, the main parts are from, in our timeline, the sixth century, um, before our timeline and the time of Alexander the Great until uh, 300 years after Alexander the Great. The language in which it, in which it is written uh, resembles, um, uh, would be an ancestor not only of Dutch and Frisian, but also of German, English, and Scandinavian languages, mostly. There's even some, la some words in Latin and Greek that seem to be derived from this language instead of the other way around, uh, what is usually assumed. And um, yeah, the contents, so there's the, the, the manuscript itself. Um, the paper was never properly studied. So if it's uh, an original, if it's really, uh, it could be, it would be a copy, a 13th century copy of older originals. Um, even if it would be a later copy of, of that copy, um, the content would still be uh, original, of course, but the paper has never been properly studied. Um, then the script, it's, um, many letters are recognizable because they are very similar to, the, to our Roman capitals, so-called Roman capitals. Some letters are uh, unique. Uh, there's a letter for NG sound, which is typical for the Northern European languages. Uh, there's some other letters, so three different A's, different E's, different O's, different U's. So usually we need accents to um, differentiate them. But in this language, uh, there are different symbols for them. Um, 
if you read the original language of the texts, you will notice, uh, if you study them, that the style and the um, spelling and the choice of words is different between these texts. And um, I don't want to say too much about the official theory about it that is promoted on, on, on Wikipedia. No, we're not here for that. No. Because one of the things that is out there, Jan, is, you know, it's the debate of the authenticity. And for me, it's a real manuscript. So what, what, whatever, whether the history of it coming into existence is true or not, or it's different than the way it's presented, that can be up for debate. But somebody took the time to create this alphabet and write a book in it or write a bunch of letters and accounts in a codex, right? So that in itself is an impressive feat. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, if, if you want to keep going, by all means, if you have other stuff to say, but I have a bunch of questions that I wanted to ask you, like, like in terms of like, what attracted you to research the Oralinda and invest your time? In like, was there something about this that came across your desk that made you see something that other people were overlooking? Um, well, I don't think many people have really looked uh, well into it um, uh, and had so much time as I had when, uh, when I discovered it. Um, well, it's a big question, actually. I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, we, or, we, yeah. can, I, I, we can bypass it, right? So whatever, if you, we can cut out everything because this isn't going to be live. So just we'll, we'll, we'll move on if you don't want to. We were um, well, saying, actually, though, before we really started recording how Jan Ott shares a very close name to the first translator of the Oralinda, Jan Ottma. And it's speculated that our Jan here uses a pseudonym, but actually it's his real name, possibly indicating a type of spiritual calling or synchronicity that <laughs> it shows just how meaningful this work is to your life's mission and life story. Very cool. So Jan is a, a quite a common name. Well, not anymore actually, because it's a traditional name. But uh, and Ott is uh, most is a, originally German or uh, Austrian Swiss name. And Ottoma is a Frisian name. But um, yeah, I, I published uh, a family uh, family tree on the internet, and uh, if that would be part of the of, of the pseudonym hoax, then. Uh, People can judge by themselves how uh, how likely that is. Um, yeah, the question it was actually very interesting, but it's um, um, before I discovered it, I had done some. Um, I thought a lot about ancient uh, about primordial language. Um, No, let's just cut it out. It's too big. And I, I told this once in, a, in an interview, and it's a big story. Yeah, don't worry about repeating yourself if, you know, we don't have to do that. I, I as, a, as a fan, like when I, I, when I see people repeating themselves, it bothers me as well. So we don't want to do that. Um, I will point out, you know, when I was looking into the Oralinda, one of the things that was said in this manuscript had to do, had to do with a, a type of Tower of Babel allegory where the original humans put here by the creator called Ralda in the Oralinda had a singular language that in its design made it difficult for them to lie or conceal their intentions. I believe it was said that people who tried to be deceitful would stammer and stutter and it would be immediately recognizable that they had bad intent and mm -hmm. that later mischievous men began to devise their own languages through which they could actually cunningly tell lies and trick people and do evil. And I found that very interesting because the overarching theme of the Frisian people or the, the cedars of this great and high culture of peace and freedom were at odds with a type of monkish priest class who wanted to corrupt the, uh, the knowledge of spiritual truths and use it as a way to control and enslave humanity. And one thing we have constantly exposed in our work together, Dylan and I, is the 
fabrication of languages and alphabets by monks and priests throughout history as a way to create ciphers and hide the truth from uh, prying eyes. So that was one of the most interesting elements of the Orlinda for me was that particular uh, origin story of language. Yes, I think because um, the meaning, all words have a meaning, even complex words, um, you can dissect them. And if if the words you use have a real meaning to you, um, in Dutch I use the example for uh, of the word uh, respect. Uh, in Dutch, it doesn't mean anything. You really have to know the meaning. But if you have the word, uh, the um, a Dutch um, synonym of that is eerbied, which you can split into eer, which is honor, and beat is from uh, to give some uh, aanbieden, um, to offer someone something. So you offer someone honor. So the word for the word re the, the, the word for respect, which is eerbied, means uh, offer honor and this is one example but if if the words you use all have a real meaning then it becomes much more difficult to use these words um, while you're actually thinking about something else and maybe in this time that we live in people are much more used to uh, to lying or to hearing lies but i can imagine that in that time uh, when the people were really honest and um, they uh, were expecting honesty they could more easily uh, recognize when people were stammering or blushing because they tried to say something and they they what they said wasn't uh, wasn't true you know what's funny is you're talking about something that is identifiably a european flaw um and there's even in english like what to be frank with somebody is to be honest right and that's after the franks and so one of the things that europeans have problems with is why would they lie the average person is just like they can't conceive somebody would swindle them this bad like and it's like that is like everybody who has european descent we do come from a culture what you just talked about and and it's really it's being exploited right now and I thought that was interesting. For a very long time, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or ever more. Ever yeah. More, uh, so lazy. one of the things I wanted to ask you, because when I go when I go on podcasts and people ask me about the Oralinda, they don't ever make claims. Um, they allude to it like that in that comment, this person should read the Oralinda or has he ever read the Oralinda? And I don't know what they want me to address in the Oralinda. So, like, is there any alternative history that you or other researchers are trying to prove with the Orlinda that, like, could be controversial or shake up the status quo? And I'll give you an example. And everybody who's been on this audience knows that one of the things that I'm controversial for is proving that um, Latin and Etruscan did not descend from Greek. And that's because Etruscan and Phoenician, all these languages, all, most of the languages that are indigenous to Italy have zero bearing on the, they're not related to Indo-European. Mm -hmm. So it means they're not coming from the East. They're not coming from the North. And that's, so I was wondering if there's anything like in that realm that you've noticed with the Oralinda that, that is kind of like underlying, like maybe like a driving force motivating you to expose. I don't really understand the question. Um... Dylan. Like, is there anything in with your research in the Oralinda? Is is your research primarily geared towards um, just translating it to the best of your ability, or do you suspect that there are alternative uh, like details in that that you suspect are will like maybe shake up the chronological order of history? Is there any like claims? You, and it's okay if the answer is no, but is there any claims you want to make that the Oralinda indicates a historical uh, shakeup of the chronological order of history that we've been given by, in Western culture? No, not chronological uh, order. I do think from other uh, researchers, uh, 
that the first millennium was not uh, a thousand years of our timeline, uh, perhaps 300 years. So the time of the Romans would be the same time as the time of Charlemagne. I've seen good evidence for that, and that would make uh, Uralinda more pl plausible because it's uh, closer by than, uh, than otherwise. And it would also mean that the, the copyist letter, the first page, um, would have an error in his um, dating. He equates the Altland dating, because they had a dating system based after the sinking of Altland, the old land. And the name Atlant, of course, is very uh, similar to Atlantis, although it doesn't really correspond with, with everything we know uh, about that from Plato. Um, and he has a Christian timeline, so we, he equates a, Christ, a Christian year with an Altland year, which would su suggest that it would indeed be um, uh, in line with our common timeline, but uh, that's a... And it's okay. Question. It's okay if you don't have an opinion on this, but I am curious. Is are you of the opinion that Atland is Atlantis? They're referring to that, or is it just a, a, a like kind of like a generic term for an old, you know, an old con older continent pre-flood? Yeah, I'm no longer very sure if uh, Plato was really uh, authentic. If, if you know the research of uh, Ivar, I think he's called. Yeah that's relevant uh, for this and uh, there was a in the um, renaissance in venice i think um, a philosopher with a very similar name to plato and um, they they argued that many texts were um, were created then there was big money involved and many people were very interested in the from the rich classes uh, so also tacitus um, these these manuscripts they, they produced will be based in part on authentic sources or on authentic knowledge that was still available. But um, yeah, the, maybe this is another another answer to your question. No, no, you're uh, doing, you're. The, I, I expose Atlantis in my book because even Plato's account comes from songs he heard as a child from Salome. So it's not even like any experiential knowledge or any manuscripts or any real sources that he was going on. And so I, I agree with you. I was just curious if you thought that Atland is Atlantis or Atlantis maybe based on Atland, whatever, whatever. Yeah. If, but if you were under the impression that Atland is referring to that, because the way they wrote about it is they said beyond the pillars of Hercules. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. pillars of Hercules, which is the um, Gibraltar, Strait of Gibraltar, right? So would you suspect Atland to be in that same region or do you suspect that Atland would just be like Doggerland or something like that? Mm -hmm. um, well, Atl Atlant Atl Atlantis as Plato described is obviously in the Atlantic Ocean. And there's one suggestion when they, in the Uralinda, when they say that Inca, which was very long ago, um, which was all, only 200 years after the sinking of Atlant, he was going to sail uh, and see if he could find re, um, remaining parts of it. But it's not very explicit as to where it was, where it would have been. And when these texts were um, put, um, where, when they were compiled, when they were um, collected in the sixth, sixth century before our uh, timeline, it was already a very old story. It was already 1600 years after the sinking of Atlant. So what they knew exactly, um, some things are a bit contradicting. And, but one misunderstanding is that, is that these people would have come from uh, Atlant. They say that the, the invaders who started to invade their lands came from Atlant. So although they used the timeline, they didn't come from it themselves. Could you and spell? Inga, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, could could so you spell Inga? May have used the term. Inga sorry. for me. Could you spell Inga's name for me? In Eng is it possible to spell in English or? Is yeah, that Inga. I N K A. So, are you aware that in America, 
there is was an indigenous people mm -hmm. you know that yeah and have you have you made the connection because i got this from old world florida narco longo he made the connection of that with ank and anchor and i noticed you got the the, the symbol of the orlinda but on your profile you got it as a uh, the helm of a ship the wheel of the ship and i was wondering if you did that on purpose because of that possible affinity for them being mariners and all that yeah i like that the steer wheel of a ship is also uh, has also six six uh, spokes yeah um i was in a line of thought when you further, when you asked earlier uh, yeah what i've noticed uh, because now the 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 first book came out in um, in 21 i think and i've I've uh, made four editions, ever improving it, and it was one of them was a was a paperback, and there's also also have been um, PDF ebooks. But the number of people online who are really discussing it um, in depth is still very uh, little, and there is a few people uh, on on Twitter I think who are uh, quite vocal about it. But they, um, it's mostly superficial, or they claim to have uh, evidence which is not very strong, it, really not strong enough. For me, it's many, many little uh, pieces of evidence together, which has um, made me convinced that it's authentic. And also the fact that there is no... Uh, no good theory about um, how it could have been created or by whom. Um, but yeah, people mention Uralinda many times, but there's there's not really much discussion about the content yet. Well, the good thing is and you're on a podcast right now who has an mm -hmm. audience that is majority. I feel like the majority of people who watch this podcast are a lot of researchers. Mm -hmm. so, nice. so you might get some inquiries about coming on other shows so it might you know you might start getting more more the more eyes will from a research perspective will look at the, the work that's why i wanted to bring you on but and also on your aura linda wiki you point out that if the book was invented it would have required archaeological knowledge that people in the 19th century when this text came to light would not have had as well as an impossible amount of time and effort with no hope of any gain for out of the forgery. Um, do you especially because back then you had to pay, you had to pay for you had to pay a press to get your stuff, but you had to provide the paper. It was all yeah. out of your own pocket. Yeah. So what is some of that archaeological aspect that they would not have been able to know in the 19th century that helps dispute claims that it's a forgery? Um now, for example, the um, Tollens uh, Valley uh, battlefield or, or massacre, they found, um, and they date, it's dated from the Bronze Age. And what they say when they found it, uh, it's so amazing that in that time already um, these tribes could put together such a big army and organize that well. Um, but it's many of those little details. Uh, there's the thing about the pole. The pile dwellings in Switzerland, but that was discovered in 18, for, um, 55 or something. So they say, okay, it must have been made after that. Uh, Can so you that's spell that? Pi what were they called? Pile dwellings? Like P I L E? Pile dwellings, yeah, in Switzerland. P I L E? Yeah. Or and there's a fragment in Uralinda when they they go visit there and they visit these uh, pile dwellings. Um, but it's also when you look at how people in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, uh, what the fantasies were about uh, ancient Friesland. Um, for example, there was one village, uh, Hindelopen, it's a detail, uh, which was considered one of the most um, original authentic um, villages but there's no word about this place in the in the book and that would have make, made sense to include that um, 
There's but so it is many possible. Things. It is possible that because this this manuscript, this codex, it's different things put together. So it is possible maybe that was written and that part of the manuscript was lost or something. You know that is yeah. on the table, right? Sure, if it's authentic, um, yeah. Um, well, so I, remember I asked you about like the the history part, and one of the reasons I brought that out is because one of the best productions out there regarding the subject is by uh, Asha Logos, and mm -hmm. we'll have all those links in the in the chat and stuff when this goes. But one of the the reason I asked you, and I'm and I'm not associating you with Asha Logos, or I know he, you guys are two different people. You have your own thing, but he claimed that. His words, the Oralinda has the potential to help rewrite key portions of human history. So that was one of that was one of the the reasons that I asked you that. But I also wanted to um, ask you in the origins of the the, the Oralinda, Jan Atima, not you for the audience, he's Jan Ot, Jan Atima stated that we may thus accept we possess in this script of which the first part was composed in the 6th century before our era, the oldest production after Homer and Hesiod of European literature. And mm -hmm. so do you accept that the first portion of the Oralinda was written in the 6th century BC? And if so, is there any like physical evidence that would uh, support that, given that it didn't appear till the late 19th century? Um, well, it's still there are no other sources uh, with the script uh, doesn't it's no uh, doesn't mean that it cannot be authentic mm -hmm. so uh, i think m already this culture uh, when the people of friso came which was the 3rd century before our uh, era um there are hints in these texts that these newcomers already it was a very different culture and that they will already have started to erase this past and then when later uh, Christianization came um, if there were manuscripts like this they will probably be um, confiscated destroyed or uh, uh, put in secret libraries or collectors that have them um, yeah the um, I, I like the example of the um, the numbers in the Alhambra palace, which I showed in one uh, video, the the one that I have in five languages. Have you seen that the um, depiction of the so-called uh, Arab numerals from one to ten? Um, I could do a screen share. Yeah, go for it. Well, where to find it easily take your time we can, always, we can always edit whatever but yeah. one of the things i think what you're getting at is the fact that people these cultures have the same numer numerical systems and the same names for them is that where you're going with this mm -hmm. or no they say that we have our um, numerals from the arabs but the shapes of our numerals only few of them are similar to the actual arab numbers and the Arabs call them call uh, call their numbers uh, Hindi or Indian, and also the Indian numerals numerals. Uh, some of them are a bit similar, but it, it's not our ten uh, numbers that we have. Now there's one depiction in the Alhambra Palace in the southern Spain, and that is considered the oldest depiction of our uh, so-called Arab numerals that we use. And these numerals, these numbers are depicted in a, in a circle, within a circle. And sometimes some spokes are added, but it's unclear how these numbers would have been taken out of a wheel in the Alhambra version. But if you put these 10 numbers of the Alhambra version and compare them to the numerals as they are in Oralinda, then it becomes really clear that the version in Oralinda is the original version. And the artist of the Alhambra will have heard that the numbers are that these numbers are derived from a wheel or from a circle, and he tried to reconstruct how that would have been, but it didn't really work out. So uh, and oh yeah, your question: the are there 
for for me personally, the languages, the Northern European languages, um, and and some words that are only found in some dialect somewhere, still. Um, if you make a family tree of the Northern European languages, then this language would would fit perfectly as the main shared ancestor. It's just a question. Eh? You both. Um, does any of you also speak German or one of the Scandinavian languages? Or yeah, Dutch, not? No. No, no I, I mean, I, I've dated some Dutch women. I went to a, a school called Hofstra in New York. And a lot of people don't realize that New York used to be New Amsterdam. Yeah. So there's a, under the gritty industry of the cities, there is still all that beautiful Dutch architecture and it's just really good culture, but that's my- It also it. said that they were, that it, New Amsterdam was populated by Friesians. Is that right? There will have been some, but not only, no. Um, uh, but no, yeah, so no, we're not very advanced in those uh, words, but there will be people out there that are, so feel free to teach us and it's stuff that we can go look, we can rewatch this, you know, and go look it up on our own. So even if there are no uh, archaeological finds with, with these letters on it, which would of course be, be perfect, but uh, even without that, there are so many traces in um, Northern European culture um, and sagas. And then there's always the question, what comes first? If this, are these texts based on what was already there in the 19th century? Then, uh, psychologically, it, it doesn't fit. Like the the so the supposed creators, the alleged creators, would have used certain details and left out many more obvious information, much more obvious information that would that would have made it more plausible in that time. That would have made it more uh, believable in that time. They were left out. So there's the situation that in the 1870s, when it became known, it was much harder to imagine this to be true than it is now. And that's what I meant with the archaeological finds that we've had in the last 100 years. So many things have been discovered that fit into this story. Um, but that the people in the, in the 18th century, now in the 19th century, I mean, could not well imagine yet. Um, and I want to put this out there. So even if like, let's say so whoever created the Orlinda, let's say it wasn't historically like accurate. It very well, when you look at those times, you had to be very careful about what you published back then. Cause that was like, just like less than like pretty much like a century into like freedom of the press. And a lot of people publishing stuff were of nobility because it required a lot of money. But it could also be a situation where somebody does have access to maybe stuff in the Vatican archives or something that does is that could be verified. So even if this even if it turned out to be that it wasn't authentic in that regard, it could be like a way of somebody putting out information without getting himself killed. And I just wanted to throw that on the table, too. Yeah, interesting thought. But um, Cornelis over the linen who came uh, out with it was a ship uh, builder for the Dutch Marines. Um, then he would, he, he should have been part of the conspiracy. Um, yeah, it's not very, it doesn't correspond with his uh, own um, stories about it. Um, to go back to a question you asked earlier, uh, what, what could be the, uh, what could be the major thing about this? The, the, there could be this bizarre situation that we discover that it becomes ever more clear that many of the classical sources are actually not authentic and they were fabricated in the Renaissance. And that could be part of the reason why this in the 19th century um, was seen as so strange because people know, knew much uh, about uh, classical th sources, 
but the more they become um, doubtful, there could be a situation that's, that this is actually this is actually one of the only one of the few uh, authentic sources. Um, well, you brought up Cornelius, and so I wanted to show you his first name. So this is stuff that it's anecdotal, but this is some of the stuff that Chance and I bring to the table in this space. We we focus on language, so. This is Hebrew. It would be uh, Kaf, uh, Resh, Nun Sofit. And so that transliterates as QRN, KRN, uh, CRN. So that's where the, the speaking of the German and all that stuff, you have things like Kornu and those like uh, those older languages that's there. It means horn, but it's also the root of Kronos. And this word in Hebrew is pronounced Keren, and it means seed or corn. Because corn, if the further back you go, it's the seed. And so his name literally has that Kronos, but also the seed of the Linda, the seed of the, and I wanted to ask you, this is my question going is, what exactly does the word or name or title or a Linda translate to you as? So Ura is uh, over the, Ura is over. And in the text meaning like itself, meaning like above, oh sorry, uh, over beyond, beyond. Okay, great. Because the Linde or the Lende is a little river, still in, in Friesland. It may have been much bigger. There's one of the Dutch provinces is called Overijssel, and the Ijssel is also a river. So it's it's common to to name the land which is on the other side of a river over the this or that. So this would have been from the perspective of of northern Friesland. When they say over the Linde, it is the, the land on the other side of the river Linde. And uh, about Korn, yeah, Kornhelia, the name is explained in Ura Linda. Um, it would have mean, yeah, the corn would be from corn. Korn, which doesn't have to be uh, mice. Um, and Helia. Yeah, it's probably something with health or a heel. Um, I'm not sure actually. But Kroder, Kro, Kronos, um, according to, the, to these texts, it's just suggested that the Kroder was a name for the, um, the carrier of time with the wheelbarrow. And there's the great bear. And it doesn't look like a bear. The star sign. It looks like a wheelbarrow. And bar or bear is an old word for barrow. So originally it will have been indeed the this Kroder from these texts it makes more sense than that it has anything to do with uh, the animal bear. And it's and the then, wheel of time because you, you yeah. can reckon time with it. You know what season it, it is based on the position of that. Yeah, in the text there's uh, often they speak of the, the carrier which uh, goes around with the wheel of time. It's a metaphor of, um, of enduring time. I'm not so used to speaking English anymore. <laughs> I speak with, uh, with Bruce with the weekly phone calls, but I, it has been a very long time that I have did an actual uh, English interview with my also You Kestin can practice Oster. on us anytime. It's, it, it's, don't worry about it. Don't, there's, there's literally no pressure. Like, don't, you're doing great. And uh, that's very impressive because most of us don't have the skill set to go talk about complex subjects with other people in another language. So amazing job. And, and you know, people can see why I respect you so much. Um, well, so you're getting into this with the wheel of time and stuff, because this is where I'm taking this. Mm -hmm. The lint, so yes, I, uh, the I, I know that this isn't what you suspect it means, but I just want to put it on the table and offer it to you. And it doesn't mean anything. I just wanted to put it out there because it's in the language. The linden is also the lime tree. And so mm -hmm. traditionally, the world tree was modeled after the holm oak, but it doesn't grow in Frisia or Scandinavia naturally. And so Yggdrasil, it was an ash tree. And the reason, where I'm, the reason this is significant is because the ash, it's a letter. So this goes back to what it's called in like 
ancient Britain or whatever as far back. It's that AE ligature. Mm-hmm. And um, this in Hebrew is aura. It's the feminine word for light. It's the same word spelled slightly differently. They transliterate it as uh, aura, but from this you get Latin words like aura or oro means gold in like Spanish, Italian, all that stuff. But this A E ligature is the ash tree. Now this A S is quite literally, if you were to literally translate this or transliterate it, it would be A S or A S H. In Hebrew, it means fire. And they transliterate it as E S H, but the Aleph is an A. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because in this world tree symbolism, whether it's Odin, um, all of them, it all pertains to like he's hung on a tree mm-hmm. and he's given the letters. And this is what I want to tie it into is this is what I call, I call it Sanskrit because it's the alphabet. And a lot of these archetypes are allegories of the alphabet. So quite literally, the linden tree is what they made um, like shields out of because it's flexible and all that stuff. And so in that, like in Latin, the order, well, you have orum. And that means gold. And so all this pertains to like light and like the golden light of the sun, but like the sun in Virgo, if it's feminine or Taurus, but sometimes it uh, relates to Venus as a morning star heralding the dawn because uh, that's also announcing the golden light of day and all that stuff. And so I wanted to bring that up with you on account of that symbol Mm -hmm. being as Asha Logos called it a symbol of the sun. And the Oralinda actually, in other languages, translating as the shield of the sun or the light of the sun. Mm. If, if, the, if that was ever like come across your desk. And um, the reason I'm going with that is because Freya is a big character in this. Or Freya, mm. Friga, right? Freka, depending on what culture. And she corresponds. It's Friday to- right now. Oh, yeah, it is. It's Freya's day, Friday, Friday yeah. yeah. I think uh, Rhea, goddess Rhea, could also be related. That's yeah, it's just, it's Freya without the R. Yeah, and Hera, without the F. mother of Rhea, is an anagram of uh, Rhea. And Rhea is also depicted with two lions, mostly, of, or, or often. Same as is uh, Sibylla, and you discussed that. Uh, and I'm not sure if, you also, if the symbolism of the lions was also mentioned in that uh, podcast you did because there's a fragment here that freya is described as her her her, um gaze was so strong that a lion would kneel uh, in front of her lions and sibylla is also depicted with two lions eh? and uh, freya of course with the wagon with the cats cats and lions is the same you know what the national symbol of india too the lions and the pillar. Oh yeah, and in many Dutch uh, heraldry, there's lions, right? like the the Frisian old Frisian uh, coat of arms, the uh, one of Flanders of Holland, and that was our team, the, Hofstra, Hofstra pride, the pride of lions. Oh, yeah. hmm. I wonder what happens with my camera because it's not it's out of focus now. And uh, we see you. Oh, okay, well you get that. Well I'll keep going while you get that because. Um, the lion, well, so what season are we in right now? We're in Leo. And so what are we in next? Virgo, the virgin. So again, it's the lion, the sun going through Leo and Virgo. This is the height of summer. And that is also the symbolism when you see like these sphinx, these like uh, lions with the virgin heads and stuff in front of temples. That's what it corresponds to. Uh, as far as what I can gather based on sources and stuff from like old text and, you know, you know, I, it does get the further you you go back in history to the time where we're trying to figure out when this was written in Orlinda. It's like you said, much of the stuff from the time, if it were to be accurate, like sixth century BC, much of it is written on like papyrus and that rots. So all you would have left is what's carved in stone. And that's why, you know, 
we barely have Phoenician and Aturian tablets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but another reason I wanted to bring this up is because in Egypt, prior to Venus and Aphrodite being ascribed to the planet Venus, it was called Phosphorus. And that means dawn bringer in the Latin. And that's where we get words like phosphorus. And the Latin correspondence to that is Lucifer. And that's what Christianity has um, kind of shifted gender, whereas it used to be a feminine archetype. Then it got switched as a masculine archetype. And that's neither here nor there, but it is interesting. And so um, Ashologos, like he said, he hit to quote him, he said, the original manuscript uses what we are now called phonetic characters. These phonetic characters are selected from a circle, the sun sign. Um, and that's in part five, one of the, uh, of his like ancient history series for those mm -hmm. who want to go look at that. But he calls the monogram a sun sign, but he doesn't say which sun sign. And that's what I wanted to bring up because he also compares it to the flower of life. And Chance, I was wondering if you have, do you have um, slides? Uh, did you like get you any of those slides the, together? The monogram of Christ? Is that what you were well, getting, let's, getting at? Let's, let's bring up the, the sun sign. So, because your audience, you know, there's a lot of people who are going to see this who have never, who have no idea how awesome this alphabet is, right? Like, this is what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't matter whether this is an authentic, the story's real or not. Somebody created this. And the average person has not seen, if you could just bring up that, um, that diagram of the wheel with all the letters to show you how each letter in the Oralinda was made using the sun sign. Okay, so here they are. And just so everybody knows, Jan, it, when this goes out, I'm going to be publishing an article to correspond with it. And I have a picture of it. Jan has actually handled this manuscript. In the physical yeah. world, he's not just speculating and talking about something he has no experience with. He's actually gone in person and held this codex. Yeah. Uh, one little thing, a detail. I heard you say uh, more often that um, Sanskrit is from Sun script or script. That's what it means, like the Holy Script or the Holy Writ. Yeah. And yeah. In this, these texts uh, suggest that, or, that it may have come from Sanskrit, at least. Uh, no, they, they don't. I, I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to make a claim, Jan. If this is legit, I believe Sanskrit would have come from this. And I'll tell you why. Because if this is legit and it's written in the sixth century, even if like your friend, the Stafford gentleman said, you know, this was never supposed to be a written language, right? It's a, it's a spoken language. Remember that? Did a podcast with them like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I think ago. it's both. Yeah, it's both. But yeah, it's, so it's not like Latin. Latin is designed to be a, sp a written language, I think. Yeah. And yeah. this is a spoken language written down. And with Latin, it's the other way around. It's a written language that is sometimes also spoken. So I would make a claim about the oral Linda. There's no pressure. And <laughs> Jan, Jan is not responsible for anything I say. But the oldest inscription. In India, it's called the Mangulam inscriptions. People can look this up. It's only dated to 250 BC. Mm -hmm. That's it. So there's no, I'm, what I'm saying is there's no way this is coming from India. They're, they're hiding our European history on. This is why I'm interested in this. Because mm -hmm. the Brahmins were forbidden to travel past the, India went all the way to what is now Pakistan back then. It was at the the, the the border of Iran and Pakistan, they were not allowed to go past that. So how did Sanskrit, which is still, it stayed in a state of perfection, which is, a, is unheard of. It's a priestly language that adheres to all its own rules, kind of like Latin. That would not have made its way to the East, if, especially if there's yet even remote possibility that this is legitimate, it would have come from Europe into mm -hmm. Asia. That, that would be my claim. And, you know, I'm not, again, he's not responsible for anything I say. Some people might get upset with that. But. Yeah, here's the word. The word Sanskrit is also here. Uh, it's visible. And on the second line, there's three lines above. Uh, and on the middle line, it says, here is that Sanskrit. Sanskrit. Script, yeah. And, and then uh, with the letters, you have the stand and the run script, the rune script. 
rune script, uh, which may have been the basis of the of the term runes. Um, it means it's a walking, it's a continuous script. Like you don't have to lift the pen from the paper when you write these other letters that are that are um, below the wheels. And um, um, one of the things I also wanted to put on your radar is in Irish, it's Sanskriovde, something like that. It's like it's mm -hmm. Sanskriov. It's it's a weird word, but it's very phonetically similar. So. Mm -hmm. Going back to the cultural diffusion aspect, this is another culture who's had their history pretty much not preserved because they've been in a constant state of war because everybody was fighting over Great Britain. But the ancient Irish have the same 17 letter alphabet pretty much as the Phoenician. Mm -hmm. And it's the same 17 letter alphabet that the Phoenicians gave the um, Greeks. So it mm -hmm. would have happened at least before like circa 750 BC sometime around then, you know, just being loosely dated because we can't really chronologically assess this stuff. But I just want to put this, like some of this cultural diffusion stuff on your radar because you might come across something in your, in your own research. Um, but now what I really wanted to bring up though is Chance, could you bring up the monogram? The first one, not the hero, but the, the first mo monogram. So the, the monogram of Christ is the wheel of the Orlando. Going mm -hmm. back to the sun. This is going to be controversial for some people because they don't want to hear that Jesus is the sun. But it's the Greek letters, which is the um, iota, which would be the I, right, right there. And then the he, which is the X. But it, so this, for people who don't know Greek, it functions like a CH or a K. It's the first two letters of Christ. So this is like CH. The P is an R, I, S, T, O, S. Jesus Christ, right? And um, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because it may it, it may help with at least the dating of this. If this this were an authentic alphabet created, it may help with that because um, for chronological purposes, Christians were not called Christians until which is Christiani till the time of Ambrose, which is like the second half of the fourth century A.D. I'm going back to some of the stuff that you were talking about how the the Roman chronology is way, it's really messed up. And that's what I'm trying to help rectify as well. Um, and the reason this is a problem for the, the Bible is the New Testament claims on its title page that it was faithfully translated from a Greek original, but it's observably monkish Latin. And I learned this from Archbishop Richard Trench. And the reason for that is when you have Christiani, this is a, a corruption. This ought to be uh, an H because that functions like uh, an E or a Latin I. And so that's what it would have been if it was authentic Greek. The fact that it's this, Chris, that means it's a, it's a Latin term. And then they just added, uh, excuse me, they, they corrupted a Greek root, which would be Chris. Mm -hmm. it, means, it means good. It would be spelled C-H-R-E-S in English. And then they put the anos, which is a Latin termination, at the end of it. So it's a creation of the monks. And I'm, I, got, I learned this from an archbishop, right? Mm -hmm. Not some numpty. And so because of that, it proves that the Bible couldn't have been written before the fourth century, which is why, according to one of the greatest biblical scholars of all time, Michaelis, he wrote uh, no manuscript of these writings uh, pertaining to the Gospels now in existence is prior to the sixth century, meaning mm -hmm. the church doesn't even have anything related to the Bible and the gospels that's prior to the sixth century. And mm -hmm. he said, what, what is to be lamented various reading, which as appears from the quotations of the fathers were in the text of the Greek Testament are to be found in none of the manuscripts, which are present remaining. So why this matters to the Orlinda? That Orlinda is so closely related to the monogram of Christ, which is the letters uh, Greek, Iota, and He. There's one is coming from the other. And if the, it would totally make sense, why going back to like the church cover up, if they base their system on this and then they took power, well, what would be the first thing to do? 
it would be to invert everything else. And that's going back to what I was saying is why, yeah, I know he was a shit builder uh, um, and all this other stuff, but what if the reason this is hidden is because people are scared to be burned at the stake by the church and they knew what the church did to their history? I, it's conspiracy, I get it, but so is the fact that this manuscript doesn't pop up till the 1800s, you know? So I like to think about everything and what could, you know, what could be going on with this. And there's even an interesting uh, part, one text uh, of the Ura Linda is about uh, Jesus' character. And Jesus would be another name of Buddha, also known as Krisen, also known as Fo. And Fo is still a known name, uh, I think, from Japan, or it's, it's a known name of, uh, of Buddha. But that one of the uh, names of Buddha would have been uh, Jesus, would be new. Uh, but it is possible that uh, later Jesus, uh, whether historical or fictional or a mix, um, would not have been the first with that name. And even in Jewish tradition, there are older rabbis who, who had that name. Uh, so wouldn't it be interesting? And the text that is about this also warns, there's a warning, like this religion that doesn't, that requires the priests to uh, speak eloquently and to uh, twist things around, will also come to, um, in our direction, it is warned. And that was, um, I don't know, the, um, this Buddha character is dated around 6th century before our uh, era. But when that warning was written, I don't know. Could it could be could have been in that time or later? Um, and that that Buddha or Jesus, Jesus character, and the Yazidis might actually also uh, descend from that tradition. So there's more, eh? and the name is split in yes and us, yes us, with a dot. And there's so much more to research that's, here. But that's the old monogram of Bacchus in Greek. Uh -huh. And so that became Latinized as IHS or mm -hmm. the root of Jesus, IES, right? Yeah. So, and the, the yes, the confirmation that we still have in English, yes. Yeah. That was already used in this old, in this old language. I'm going to so, blow your mind right now. Have you ever looked into the Gothic language? Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm getting excited. It may be interesting that ja, we is also, a uh, ja is the, is the German and Dutch uh, confirmation of yes, like yes. So I don't know if that's a coincidence. Uh, no, yeah, it's not. Hmm? This is transliterates as IE, which is, they say, ja. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the first two letters of tetragra oops, tetragrammaton, yod hey vav hey. Right? So it's literally there. Yah, that's Jesus. That's also an epithet. It looks like this yeah. in Greek. So that's yeah. also an epithet for Apollo. So all this, this is what I'm saying. It is a, it's a priestly system and it is all related to the sun, which is what really got me interested. When I start the deeper, I look at the Oralinda, I'm seeing this system. And if it's legit, there's no way that they're not taken from it. And so one of the things I wanted to bring up with you, because you had just mentioned um, Jesus and all that stuff, right? Well, this is from Suetonius. In the Gothic language, I'm going to write it out. As, is, or Jesus is the name of Odin. By way of distinction, that of God. Its plural is Asar or Asir. And in Etrusian, that's the name for God. Oh, excuse me. 
And I'll just throw this on the screen. This is one of the main symbols of Buddhism, what they call the Dharma wheel or the Dharma chakra. Mm -hmm. There we go. There you have it. It's the same as the XI monogram of Christ. Well, then it's eight, uh, eight spokes eh? and the uh, monogram yeah. of Christ is uh, six. Uh, but uh, in India, I've seen many uh, six spokes wheels as well, which they also they, they call the Kali chakra. And it's also the wheel of time. And with Christmas, um, they even bake cookies uh, in, in the shape of a six spoke wheel there. So six and eight spokes, uh, they're used, they're both used, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so remember when I said earlier that the reason I was tying this in with the, the Hebrew uh, Aleph Shin, which is As or Ash, or esh, right? It's the it's the last radical in the word James, right? As is Odin. That's fire. Ash, esh in Hebrew is fire, but then you have that ash tree that he's crucified or that he's hanged on for the, the letters. And this is the syncretizing of that system. And the word guard means place or um like district or like a, a holy circle or sacred enclosure that you'll see at the end of uh, like towns like Stuttgart all that stuff yeah. like that Garda is also in these texts is also a common uh, name for places Garda yeah and so in in Greece or, or in the Greek word it looks like the the G looks like a like almost like a Y the gamma but it's pronounced like a, a Y so like we say like they say or not we I'm not Greek but Oh, sorry, I'm writing in Greek. They have a gyro, but we say they say hero or yoro. Mm -hmm. So guard, guard to us is yard to them. And that's where our English comes, our yard, our front yard. Yeah. And so basically where I was going with that is as guard is the sacred place or the enclosure district or yard, etc., of Odin, the sun. And the reason I can prove it's the sun is because uh, I can say the Latin. Uh, Sol in etrusia etiam lingua esar vocatus est. And so what that means is Sol, the sun, in the Etrusian language is called esar. And so I just wanted to put that out there. It's, it's something. And so when you have that, the Nordic, the Asir being plural or this Asad being plural. Well, who's in that? Freya. She's one of the Asir, right? I see. Of the, well, she later became one of the Asir, but she was of the Faner. Okay. Originally. Um, and maybe important to add is that these people from these texts, from the Uralina texts, describe how in Scandinavia there was very early on there was an invasion from the east of what they called the Magyar and the Finna. There were two peoples, a priest, a, um, a dominant class, a master with their uh, slave class. And from there they, um, one character from this people, yeah, um, was married to the daughter of the Magi, the, the, the head priest, and then his son became a um, hereditary king. And they also kidnapped people, uh, children from our, from the, from the free, from the Freya's people. So although they genetically were similar, partly through this kidnapping and, and mixing, uh, and, and because the Freya's originally lived there, but they were conquered um, there was a cultural um, um, link and a genetic link but there were also significant differences and the Finnish language for example is also very different from the other Scandinavian languages um, and similar with that is that uh, in these texts there's a Kelta figure, figure who splits off from the main uh, Freya's land. And she uh, later cooperates with the um, 
missionary priests from Sidon uh, from, uh, with the Phoenicians and the uh, people from uh, Tyre. <laughs> and they also uh, went to um, what's now Great Britain. So, and the Gola or the Gauls, uh, probably. Um, that's that's were sort of the adversaries of the Freya people from these texts. So there was trade between the Phoenicians, the Tyrians, and the and the Freyas, but there are several examples of um, of um, animosity, like they were pirating the ships of the Phoenicians. And at some point, they they worked together with the the Danes again. But there's a lot about the different uh, peoples from. Can you spell that name, Kel Kelta? Kelta, uh, K A L T A. So one thing so I noticed in you know, you're talking about the animosity, mm -hmm. it, I noticed that the in this script, stand script, it, the F letter looks a lot like a T, which is a little bit more of a slanty line, not quite as horizontal. And I wondered if. Hmm? I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, when we see the Freya, if someone were to mistake that F rune for a T, if we're seeing something like Tria or Troya come out of it. Troy is mentioned in the texts, but not very explicitly where it was, where it would have been. Um, and then you suppose that people are already reading mostly, but I think, yeah, reading was um, I, I'm not really sure what what you mean with the with what you said. So there would be confusion between Freya and Troy. Yeah, somehow. because phonetically, Troya, Freya, the the e and o interchange in in various uh, languages ah. like. Okay, so then like you don't even have to go that far back to English where like mm -hmm. you'll see words like if I had to say show, right? I'll show you this, I'll show I'm showing you this board. But in, in like a couple hundred years ago, it would be S H E W, a shoe, mm -hmm. a shoe. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of so we focus on the interchangeability in letters. And so that's just mm -hmm. something he he picked out. And, yeah, um, wondering if the mythos of Troy and its downfall has anything to do with the whatever this mother culture was being destroyed by more greedy elements jan where's frizo from where does he say he's from uh i think he was from india um well i guess i, I guess what i saw in the script it said and it said he was from krakenland right that's correct the yeah king of the the people, frizo is the king of the frisians right the later Frisians, yeah, it's true because it's confusing because in the all in the um, Frisian chronicles, he is described as descending from India, an Indian prince, and because there is this Farismanes who was a son of a satrap, a satrap in uh, Persia, which was a a land um, um, a ruler in the time of Alexander. And it's plausible that this Friso was actually the son of this satrap, but he could still have uh, descended from Athens. And that's probably what it says here. Yeah, from Athens he was. Well, so that right. Kalta, you said uh, in, in Phoenician, because you tied mm -hmm. in the Phoenicians, Kelta is, is like yellow or saffron, and that's why the Celts were called Kelti. Because uh -huh. They had the blonde hair, and yeah. the the another name because for the Etruscans, which are the ancient Italians, are Tyrrhenians. That's what the Greek called them. But they also called them Pelagians or Pelasians. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring that up is because they've taught us the Phoenicians are from the east. And so this is what my work is controversial about. Is I'm saying no, 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 no. The Hebrew has zero, almost no affinity. I won't say zero, but it has almost no affinity to Phoenician other than mm -hmm. it takes its alphabet, which suggests they use that system through conquest, right? They taught it to their priesthood, whatever. But the language it has affinity to 
is going to be the Celtic and the Etruscan and all the Etruscan. I say Etruscan because in Latin it's Etrusia, Etruscan mm-hmm. or Etrusci. But I wanted to put, again, float that out there because one of the things that Asher Logos didn't, and I'm not tying you to Asher Logos, but he did write the foreword to your book. Am I yeah, correct? Yeah, we so, incorporated it. So one of the things he's into is talking about these maritime races and stuff, but he doesn't mention the Italians very much, if at all. And they're a huge part of that system. And Chance, could you bring up the Isis? Do you have that from the boatman pillar? If not, it's okay. But I was going to show you, um, I was going to ask you and other researchers who see this to send it to them, whatever. If we can get some artifacts related to these things, it'll help us where this the uh, pillar of the boatman was found was in the bowels of Notre Dame. It had been repurposed. And when they were doing renovations, they found the, the pieces of the pillar from this is French golf circa 1000, uh, 100, the first century AD. And this is basically like the Jesus archetype before. And he's a God of war back then, like Mars, like Jesus, Isus, uh, another name for Odin. And uh, when that comes up, you'll see it. Um, it should be but, up now. I don't know why there's a delay in it coming up, but it's on my screen. I've oh, I see it now. It. Okay, good. Yeah, so if you could zoom in just so people could see the inscription right above his head. He's got mm-hmm. that club. He's got the club of Jan, of Janus. Uh, and so you see that, E-S-U-S, right? And so I, what I want to put out there for if you forward this to anybody, whoever sees this, any type of artifact that's coming from these areas, this is French Gaul. If you ever come across something, don't dismiss it as forgery necessarily, because that's what's happened to a lot of the artifacts in Italy, because they already had the crucifix and the crucified savior before the Christian era. And when they saw stuff and was like, this is dating way before Christ, they thought it was forgery and destroyed it when it was not. It was actually proving that the church hijacked a system that was already existent in Europe. And that's why I'm, that, the reason I'm passionate about this stuff is because if you don't know your culture's history, anybody can take it from you, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, I feel like a lot of our, our woes are just, we don't have, we don't, we don't remember our history. And it's hard to make sense of what's going on in the world because we can't see, you know, everything's such a... Um, Clusterfuck, but I wanted to ask you, so what's the Dutch word for Greece? For? For Greece. How would you say Greece in uh, Dutch? Yeah, Griekenland. Griekenland. That's, pretty, that's pretty close to Krekenland, right? Yeah, Griekenland, Griekenland, yeah. So, and the reason I say this, because for the audience, the way it's spelled is K-R-E-K-A. Oh, sorry, K-R-E-K-A-L-A-N. N-D. Mm-hmm. But that K and G interchange going all the way back to the ancient world. And so I was I think gonna... in, uh, in Finnish or Estonian, it's still Kraika. Kraika? With a hard K, Kraika. You even see that in Freya, right? Like, because in some cultures they spell it with a F R E K E, right? Like Freka or Fre- you know, like Freya. But they say Freka or Frika. Freya. Frig is another, is the. Is supposed uh, wife of Odin in the Norse mythology. Yeah, I've recently read a book to my oldest children uh, with uh, Edda yeah, tales, mm-hmm. yeah, rewritten for children. And it became, I had written, I had read uh, earlier, other versions of these tales uh, much earlier. But now it really struck me as um, being of a later, uh, being later in the evolution of thought. Because some ideas are really more complex, more they would have come after the the sort of reasoning that I find in the Uralinda texts. Gotcha. So, Chance, do you have that um, battle that I pulled up? Just because you, uh, Jan, you said that origin story of Frisia. I, I think it'd be more likely India. Like I don't think he would have been able to sail from Greece to pass the pillars of Hercules, pass Britain, and then to, to the shores of uh, Phrygia, because at that time, around like the fourth century BC, right? Would have been the 300s, somewhere like around then. 
they wouldn't have allowed random boats uh, through their trade routes to explore new lands because um, at that time, the Phoenicians and Etruscans and Carthaginian, all these people in the Mediterranean, they were considered pirates, right? This maritime empire, unless they, unless Frigio is one of them, that'd be, that's a different story. If it comes out that he actually is part of that, the mariner, the, the holy sailors, right? Which is why they would have had these, this alphabet. Um, I, it's called the Battle of Alalia. Do you have that chance? It's like going to be like a, a map of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Then you see Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, all that stuff with some Etruscan towns. And I just wanted to show you where this was because um, this happened in about uh, some, they say 540 BC and 535 BC off the coast of Corsica between the Greeks and the allied Etruscans and Carthaginians. And so this would have been a decade or two after the first part of Oralinda was written by Adela. That's how you say her word. I apologize. But the part about Friso returning was uh, 300 years after Adela. Yeah. Yes. And yes. there is a sea battle described where uh, the fleet of Alexander of uh, Friso, because this was really a fleet of many ships, mm -hmm. um, was attacked by Phoenician or Tyrian uh, ships. That, that is described in one of the texts. So this, it might actually be alluding to this incident because, well, actually, no, this would, this would be later on then. But the reason, being, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it was a, a Greek force of 60 ships and they were attacked by 120 ships, allegedly, from the Punic or Etruscan fleet. And the Greeks were emigrating to the Western Mediterranean, which would be on um, Corsica, that's where they were going. And so although the Greeks had driven the fleet off, they lost almost two thirds of their own fleet in doing so. And so Herodotus wrote about this and he called it a Pyrrhic victory. Mm -hmm. And after that, subsequently, Carthage closed the Strait of Gibraltar to Greek shipping and thus contained the Greek expansion in Spain by 480 BC. So Frigio is claimed to be a leader of the group of Phrygian colonists who had settled in, uh, was it uh, Punjab in Northern India? That's, mm -hmm. that's another interesting location because it's just southeast of the capital of Tartaria. And I'm not into the Tartaria research. I've debunked a lot of the claims a lot of those people make, but that doesn't mean tar Tartary didn't exist, you know? Um, and th so that was, uh, that was uh, the capital, I guess. Uh, there's like a millennium, well over a millennium before they were discovered by Alexander the Great, the, the Tartary mm. and all that stuff. There's a significant place, uh, Taxila, I think, also in that area, northern you, India. You, do you remember how to spell it? If not, I'll just... Uh, Taxila, I think, T-A-X-I-L-A. Okay. Which is also similar, of this. course, to, to Texland. Yes. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Thessaloniki, perhaps, also. Yeah. And, uh, the, um, there's Stavren, in, uh, still in Dutch, uh, Stavoren. And there's many places in uh, in Greece uh, with with Stavros or Stavre. And that oh, X little... and S interchange. So Texland is Tesland or, you know. Yeah, it... we also say Tesol for Texel, yeah. Tesol. That's um, wow. Yeah, that's from te, uh, Tasia uh, to Thai, uh, weave. It was textile. It has to do with textile. Great. So the real reason I wanted to bring that up is because if they closed the Strait of Gibraltar by 480 BC, mm -hmm. um, then like two centuries later or whatever, unless, unless Frigio had some sort of relationship with them, they wouldn't have let him pass. That's, that, would be my, that would be my thing because that piracy stuff, like maritime commerce, that is who, who maintains uh, the trade, you know, like that's who's going to be the maritime empire is going to be the, the, the king of the hill, if you will. And you have like, um, like basically, I want, like, I wanted to cite there was an article written on November 16th, 1871. And it basically just says, when they came to land, a young man jumped ashore and his hands were, he carried a shield. And I wonder if that's, an, an allegory from bringing with him the Oralinda, 
but mm-hmm. I, you know, it could just be bullshit, but on which were laid bread and salt. After him came an old man. He said, mm-hmm. we come from the far Krekeland to preserve our customs. Now we wish that you are so friendly as to give us enough land to live on. That to me doesn't jive with them being Phoenicians because if they were Phoenicians, they would have already, or like allied or struck deals with them. I don't think they would have just been allowed to go and settle wherever they want, which is why I think they didn't go by boat. They probably came by land. And that's just, it's just, it's just something I wanted to put out there for people to think about when they chronologically try to date this. Um, Cause this could all be bullshit, right? Like everything I'm reading you could be total never history that never happened and it's just fiction by homer and herodotus and all these people well in these texts it says that uh, friso uh, first um uh was working together with nearchus the naval uh, admiral of alexander the great mm-hmm. and these people from the indus valley region had helped the fle- um the army of alexander the great go back to the Mediterranean and they went over land. You remember? Um, yeah, I've read, it, I've read it briefly. So how they went into the Mediterranean, uh, maybe it's not possible. They, they came, they arrived into the Mediterranean when he was still in the service of Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. And then when Alexander died and there were um, conflicts between the successors or uh, the the people who were going to uh, preserve his his empire uh, and it fell apart and then um, these people uh, for a while they worked for um, Demetrius I think or for yeah I think for Demetrius one of these uh, these princes from uh, Athens and then they decided to uh, Oh yeah, because one of them said you um, you should settle in um, Phoenicia, and they didn't want that. They wanted to migrate back to uh, Freya's land, where they where their ancestors had come from originally. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then it is described how they were attacked by um, Phoenician or Tyrian. I forgot how it was described. I had a list of all the relevant chapters. I can I can send it to you afterwards. Um, yeah, I have I have the manuscript, or like I have I, it's it's obviously not your translation, right? But I have I've, I've seen. seen what's so the most um, the most up to date translation by myself is on the wiki, and it also has the Sandbach version. So I don't think there are any other OL. Oh, well, Raubenheimer uh, adapted the Senbach translation. So he didn't study the original language, he just changed some wordings to his liking. So I don't know which uh, translation you use then. Uh, it was on Guggen, Guggen something books, Guggen, uh, it's, a, it's a database of old texts. Yeah, uh, that's the Senbach yeah. edition of 1876. Yeah. And on my uh, wiki, there's a free version. Um, anyone can read it, the, the most up-to-date version of the newest translation, where you can very easily compare with the, with the transcription or transliteration. You can choose if you want to read the original letters or the Latin uh, capitals. But you will know that because you sometimes watch the, the chats I have with uh, Bruce Stafford. Yeah, I listen when I can. Then we often show... Uh, how it works, the wiki. So if I show you this, do you know what that, how that is pronounced in Greek? Yeah, F Fre. Yeah. Fre. So that is an old name for the sun. So it would transliterate for the audience like this. But again, this H is accented. It, it functions like a, like a Latin I. So it's free. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because, like, if I, you know, if I were to write this in the the runes, it's basically right, free, the root of Frisia again, the sun, mm-hmm. uh, free sun, Frisian of the sun. I just wanted to bring that up because that is going to be the same root as Freya, 
right? Or also friso. And the reason I want to bring this up is iso. So if you were to look this up in Hebrew, it'd be yod, shin, uh, is it, I think it's ayin, right? There's two, there's two variants of this. So it lo- translates, transliterates this way, I-S-O, but they say, they say yasha. They say, they don't pronounce it like the way it looks in English, but just going to the system, it is literally the son, and this means savior, deliverer. So the mm-hmm. savior son is in the name Frisha or Frizo. And I just wanted to put that out there and see what you thought about that. If there's any there there, or if that's just me looking into stuff too much. Um, it may have been uh, the case later. There's no hint in Uralinda that it had a, uh, some meaning like that. Okay. Um, um, but it's very well possible that, that these names in other languages had other uh, associations. And also these people, sometimes they explain uh, the name of something uh, within their own language, and it may not be the the correct trans, um, etymology, but it's uh, an association they had with it. Asha, <laughs> the reason I bring it up is because Asha focused on chance. You want to bring up the Frisian cap or Frisian cap, if you can. Oh. He 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 taught he covered it, and I'm again I'm not associating you with Asha logos, but it is out there, and so he makes the claim, or not the claim. He he brings up the Frisian. Some people would say it, cat, but mm-hmm. if you were to look at that G, that gamma, yeah. like in, in Greek, it would be frian. Yeah. And that cap is also known as the liberty cap. And that's yeah. called Liberia, uh, uh, liber- liberia in uh, Mithraism. And it's basically, it, it marked when you got that cap in the old days, it, it was, you were a free slave now. Like you be, in, and in Freemasonry, it became a supreme mark of initiation. And that's why they used it in the adepts or the initiates or the epops, which is an overseer watcher in the Eleusinian mysteries. And fishermen on the Faroe Islands, um, they used to have exactly that sort of uh, cap as well. So, you know where the Faroe Islands are? Um, yeah, they're north of, uh, they're in the north, uh, what, what sea is that? It's north in of North Britain. Sea, yeah. Between, yeah. Nor- between Norway and Iceland, yeah. Yeah, and um, so I just wanted to put that out there in case anything does turn up in that because I feel like that is symbolism. I just can't, uh, I can't overlook it for me. It's, it's just yeah. so, it's so right in your face that I'm like, it's impossible for these systems not to be connected. We keep finding things like that. Yeah, and also there's even the Prussian, um, the name Prussia could be related. Yeah. B and F are very close together. Yeah, again, and, and guess what? In, in Greek, right, that oops, upsilon or upsilon, it, it's basically mm-hmm. like a Y. So uh, Prussia would literally be Frisia. Yeah. The same, it's literally the same, or Frisia, I don't know how you say it, but it's it that's what i'm saying like there is it's either that they're all connected or whoever does this conquest has a habit of you reusing the same system um to to name things and um i don't know I, these are just things that i wanted to to run by you but if we could before we let you go do you have time to talk about minerva real quick yeah um do you remember how Minerva is spelled in the runes? Like, because when I was looking at the, 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 I have the transcription, like the, the one I have at Project Gutenheim, it has the regular language written out, but then it has the English language. But the way mm-hmm. they wrote it in English was uh, like, it was something like that. There was like a hyphen in it or something like that. I was wondering if you could shine light on that and how it's actually written in the manuscript. Well, I can uh, share the screen again. Yeah, of course. It would be easiest to think. Oh, this, this is awesome for us because we like, you know, we're really into this stuff and learning about, you know, what's going on. So here you also have a demonstration of how the 
wiki works. Um, then I go to English translations. Uh, Minerva, that was the, here, let's take this one. Uh, I'll make it a bit bigger. Yeah, and the reason I'm asking about this, because it struck a chord, because your friend is really quite fond of the Minerva character. And, yeah. I, and nobody, I haven't heard anybody talk about what I wanted to bring up. Um, do you see this, this screen now with the... Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had another one, um, this one, yeah. Now it's here. Um, Uta scripta minos. Um, do you see my uh, pointer as well? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. You said. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. There's a space in between it. Me, it's almost like M -N M I N A. Oh, here it says Mina Erva. She is explaining her name. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Danai Heleni Helenia Dam. Minerva. Here it is Minerva, but it's hyphenated with the dot. Gotcha. So it's almost like two names, because usually when you see that dot in attrition, it's yeah. like separating words. It's it's correct, because here she explains Mina Erva, which means my uh, um, my inheritance or my um, uh, my possessions I carry in my bosom. Kind of interesting. The uh, the the Greek word for the euro is evro, just hmm. kind of like Irva, <laughs> backwards Possess possessions. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is because in um, let's see here. In what uh, does the Aura Linda say about Minerva? Let me start there. There's quite a bit. But yeah, go for it, Jan, if you want to want to jump in. Yeah, Minerva would have been um, uh, a Burg maiden or a, yeah, and when there was a had been a conflict with Kelta, which was at the same time. Could you uh, real quick, could you explain to us in like layman terms what a Burg maiden is? Because I've looked, uh, I looked it up online. There's not a whole lot about it. No. And like maybe there's uh, something lost. Like, is that mean she was a prostitute? You know, like the town. No. What does that mean, Bergmead? Um, so these people, because they saw themselves as children of Freya, and they saw themselves as one big family, yeah, brothers and sisters. Um, Freya's band, Freya's children, is, was the name of their people, Freya's folk. But they had a, a folk mother, which was a mother of the people, which was a, a wise woman who was residing at the main uh, borough or citadel. And she had um, maidens around her. Um, and every burg or citadel had uh, had its own uh, mother figure. And she didn't rule like a queen with, with absolute power. She could be um, punished very severely if she would have um, given bad advice intentionally or something like that. Um, maidens were, it's uh, comparable to the Vestal Virgins. They would um, watch over the, the perpetual fire, which was sacred, sacred symbol. And they would also um, give advice, do healing. Uh, younger maidens uh, could be on the Berg to, to learn and to prepare for uh, motherhood. So they, they didn't always stay there, but um, because language and culture are primarily um, passed on by mothers to their children. It's still uh, usually in, in normal cases, mothers have their little children around them uh, in the early years. And that's why they say mother tongue. And you usually learn the language from your mother primarily. And um, like the this like the symbols in a way, or related to that concept. I heard half of the broadcast you did because I was doing a, a job in the house, but I sometimes make noise, so I didn't hear everything. Uh, I haven't studied the symbols. It only struck me that the that symbol is also depicted with the two lions, just like Ria and Freya. So I suspected some sort of uh, relation there. 
But I'm this not sure what, what this is. is what I'm getting at. So, so yeah. in the in the Oralinda, and you let me know if this translation is garbage. But what I have is it said when Nihalena or Nihalenia, whose real name was Minerva, and I need to point that out that Nihalenia is basically New Helen, like a new version of Helen. And um, well, it, the name is suggested to mean um, yeah, Hell. Hell is um, also light. Yeah, Helios. Uh, and Helios. Lenia, Lenia is um, to um, to lend or to um, provide. Yeah. So, so she the, she she provided new light. Ni Hel Lenia. And so Helen Eleni, right? That's who. Is, so going back to what Chance said about Troy, remember with the the Frisia, uh, free, uh, uh and the possibility with the Troy, the T interchange with the F. Well, Troy is what's taken, and that starts the Trojan. Uh, sorry, Helen, right? But that's astrotheology. And so what it says in the um, Oralinda is when Nihalena, whose real name is Minerva, or Min Erfa, was established, the Krekelanders loved her as well as our own people did. There came some princes and priests to her citadel and asked Minerva where her possessions lay. Helen, Helenia answered, and, I, and maybe I miscopied this, but it went from being Ni Helenia to just Helenia. Yeah. And, I don't, and then she said, she answered, I carry my possessions in my bosom. As you said, what I have inherited is love of wisdom, justice, and freedom. So here we go with that free Freemasonry, Freya, Frisia, free in caps, the freed slave. But then also, that's the, the, the Virgin, Virgo, with the scales next to her Libra. Do you see that? She's blindfolded and all that stuff. And so she's admitting right there, wisdom, the doctrine of wisdom. The reason I wanted to bring this up is Minerva comes from the head of Tinya, which is basically the Phoenician Jupiter. And this is an Etruscan deity. And it's basically spelled, if you were to spell it in um, Etruscan, it would be M-E-N-R-V-A. Men, uh, it would be Minerva, right? Menva, whatever. But if you look online, you're going to see that they, they, it claims that they got this from the Latin Minerva. But in the Greek, it's Athena. And this is also a character in the Oralinda. But this Athena in Irish would be, in the, or I should say in the Celtic, Athena, and this is according to Betham. This is not my research I'm putting out. Athena means from Tinya, from the head of Tinya, which is what Britain is named after, basically. Britannic, Britannia, means the land of tin. And tin corresponds to Jupiter in alchemy or in uh, metallurgy. And so I want to bring this up because this is a possible dating mechanism. This is a Tinya is Phoenician. The Etruscan Minerva comes from the Phoenician head of Tinya, right? Phoenician deity. That's what the Greeks used. The Latins took Minerva because they're descended from Etruscan, because Rome was quasi Etruscan. And this is where I think the church is covering up a lot of that history where Rome starts way later than they've told us. And the reason I bring this up is because it is the Latin version that is spelled like it is in the Oralinda Minerva. It is not the Etruscan version. And Chance, if you want, if you have that image of the, or that link to the, um, the Etruscan plate with Minerva on it, you could zoom in so Jan could see what we're talking about, how it's spelled. Um, if not, that's okay too. But if it's spelled like this in the runes, that's Latinized. So this, um, is she on there? Yeah. So if you look on the on the left scene, the second name from the left is going to be Minerva. It, it reads like Hebrew from right to left. Yeah. And um, these plates are circa like third century to like sixth century BC. And I just want to put this on your radar because this might be some of the stuff that isn't adding up that you might be able to make sense of 
and bring some things together that I wouldn't be able to see or that other researchers wouldn't be able to see. And that's why I wanted to have you on because it means where, wherever Minerva, whoever's writing this, it's getting it from a Latinized version. Now that doesn't mean it wasn't originally written like the Etruscan version, but because the script is going left to right, it tells me it's dating to when that shift happened from light to uh, from right to left because they used to do like that booster booster Fidon style where they like write like this and you know it's like a weird <laughs> everything's backwards and then forwards and back and it's so it's weird well to i'd like to see a, a higher a better quality um image of that but um yeah um i've i've got one right here i'm gonna post it in the um in our stream yard yeah. So you can. But a note uh, about that. Uh, also in Uralinde, there is often very different spelling. So spelling is not always very strict. Well, Minerva is always spelled the same, but many other names, for example, uh, Phoenicia, has four or five or six different spellings. Mm -hmm. uh, we are used to one standard spelling, but that does, hasn't been um, the case, especially not with a spoken language that's written down. And you, when you it, Read it out well, loud. What, we have, what we have in the Etruscan, though, has generally been uniform to how that's been spelled. And no, so I no. just wanted to bring that up because that is older than, like, so, I want, so what I would like to see is people provide some artifacts. Like, this would prove the case one way or another. If somebody can provide an artifact that outdates this, where it's written like that, then that would be a huge uh, win for everybody who's trying to chronologically place things, you know? Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't call the, the Freya spelling a uh, Latinized uh, spelling. It can just be the case that in this case, uh, the Latins took over exact the same spelling as the Freyas already had, did, had. And in many cases, the Latin is a corruption of the original Freyas. For example, with the verbs uh, entrare or penetrare. Mm -hmm. In this language, uh, it, it means intrada or binetrada, uh, which are words that you can actually split and has a meaning. Um, and lux, uh, lucia, uh, light, um, that would come from logos of loga, which is a flame. So the well, Greek loga, Latin lux. That's in Irish too. So if you were to look at it in Irish. Yeah. It's uh, L-O-G-H, for those who want to see it, L-O-G-H. And that is the spiritual fire that the Irish call down yeah. from heaven or God, yeah. Oh, yeah. who they also yeah. call Isar. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. There's, this is so interconnected. It's going to, there is a story here it, and it doesn't matter. So I guess what I'm trying to put the call out to people and bring more eyes to this is that, there you go, yep, is... The more people look at this, the more they're going to be looking for it when they see old artifacts. And this is one of the things that archaeologists, I feel like archaeologists are not doing a great job because they're not, they've never even looked or taken any of this stuff seriously. And so when they're making discoveries, they're not able to date stuff because they're not using language. They're not using or taking into account the interchangeability of like a letter. Sometimes they are, sometimes some of them are really good, but I, I, I bet there's some great archaeologists out there who might come across a, a show like this or a conversation like this and incorporate what you're talking about, what I'm talking about, what Chance is talking about into their work. And they might make really significant studies that they wouldn't have otherwise made because they didn't think about this stuff, you know? It's even possible that uh, um, things that have been found with letters like this uh, on it uh, may have been um, Put away. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, they, they I have seen some charts with with letters that are exact the same as here. And there's the um, Meroitic K, which uh, is exactly the K from this wheel, but then with a piece of the round wheel on it. That's only one detail. Um, if you haven't seen the the one hour uh, video that I made earlier, much earlier which is available in five languages, it's uh, saved from the flood. And there are uh, some of the, these details. Uh, what I'm showing here is the Alhambra numbers that I talked earlier about. 
So the top row is found on a, on a palace in southern Spain. And you see our numbers, but they're, they're, they're um, depicted inside circles and sometimes with, uh, with, a, with spokes or with a diagonal. But it's not clear what the function is of these diagonals. See what I mean? And then in the one from Uralinda, it's explained how the numbers are taken out of the wheel. And that makes sense. And then the, the where it says room, so below the wheels, it's actually how they were quickly written. Uh, where it says stunt, it's how they were designed. But when they write them, they are not always so geometrically uh, geometrically perfect. And then they 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 look like the 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 line below, and that's how the ones in the Alhambra look. But then with a circle around it. So these circles of the Alhambra only make sense. Uh, would make sense if if it's actually a reference to the more original Freya's numbers, and then he didn't really know how the how to uh, put them inside of a wheel. So that that would be an artifact, and I've only seen this this depiction of the numbers from Alhambra, not an actual modern photograph. Oh, okay. I was just about to ask you if there's any. Uh... I would love to get that artifact or somebody so yeah. put that out there. So if anyone sees this and you're in Spain, please go look for yeah. this and get us a high quality photo. Yeah. You know what the is Alhambra is Alhambra like a, a cathedral or something? Is it one building? No, or is it a palace? Um, it's the palace. You can easily Google it, uh, Alhambra Palace in Spain. Then you'll find pictures. It's from, uh, it's dated, I think, from the 1200s or 1300s, something like that. Almost a thousand years old. A bribe whoever you got a bribe to get in there, people. Come on, those do those dollars go far over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's already eight. I think we have been yeah. talking for two hours no, this already. Is perfect. This is perfect, man. This is a great, great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. And any Many details things? and sometimes a bit chaotic, but um, yeah. No, that's okay. That's, I mean, that's the thing is it's a work in progress. You know, it's like a river flowing. So it's not going to be a static situation as you come across more info. And I wonder. Well, if this, if, if this has made people curious, uh, then on my YouTube channel, there are some proper presentations with a, a beginning, a middle and an end, and sometimes illustrations as well. Um, the, more, the more recent ones have been in Dutch, but they have English subtitles. But there's also the interview with Catherine Austin Fitz, and that's in English, of course. And there's the, the full long version, but there's also an edited version of half an hour, which has the best parts in it, I think. And that could be a good uh, way to, to uh, be properly introduced. And then you can uh, watch this back and perhaps see some uh, interesting details. It was also for us an experiment. I'm not really used to talking to a camera and a, and a microphone. No, you, you did great. You did fantastic, okay. man. It was, it was a really fun. Con you, the people are going to love this. I enjoyed uh, talking to you too. Thank you. Yeah. And so if you have any future ideas, if you ever want to bounce anything off of us, please, the door's always open. Don't be shy. And uh, don't worry about being judged over here because we're on like, we're, there's a lot of stuff that we're just constantly looking at and readjusting. And, you know, sometimes what we thought was right a couple months ago, we have new evidence comes to play. And yeah, I'm also open for uh... I'm also open for new uh, ideas and new insights. Uh, yeah. And oh yeah, well, I add, of course, I should add that there have been uh, books. Uh, they have been sold out for a while, and we haven't printed a new one yet because we are making so many new edits. In particular, nowadays, in the, late, the last few weeks, months already, uh, we have been updating the transcription, transliteration. Have you ever thought about self-publishing? I do so. I have. Um, Okay. Do you do it? Do you I use Amazon? Found a foundation to uh, to do the publishing. So the okay. foundation was created by myself. I'm not using um, a big company uh, to to ship them. So but I go know, to the print myself. 
you could do that though in addition right you know you could you could like use like um ingram spark or something to have your books or just amazon directly to get your books mm -hmm. there and then what you could do is create an affiliate link so on all of your youtube channels you have your links and when we when people put their podcasts up with you they can put a link in affiliate link and you make money when people buy your books it's just a way to grow your business it's just something to think about but i wanted yeah. to make sure you knew that if you ever need help with the sub self-publishing i can help you whether it's with book covers for free i'm not i'm just yeah. letting you know like I'll, well, I'll well I've, I've designed uh, the book myself and i've had four editions printed uh and i Sometimes I, all, I even uh, put them on the mail myself. Um, and at the moment, there is the, the ebook, the PDF is still uh, for sale on the website. Uh, but the more, the most uh, up to date version is on the wiki. And I've seen, um, I've seen uh, second hand of the first editions being offered for uh, $700 now, somewhere with rarebooks.com so i don't, yeah. I don't know if anyone will actually pay that for, but uh, even the last edition is being sold now second hand for a hundred dollars i think so you also I should use, um, have another one printed you could also use substack too you should you should get on there because with substack you can post your podcast you could post chapters of your book little you could just publish research as it goes and put certain amounts of it for free mm. and certain amounts of it behind a paywall so your subscribers can support you that way too. So I just want to put these things out there, man, help okay. you get, get more exposure. Perhaps, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Jan. I'm really interested to research this text further and uh, we may have started out our first time bringing it to this channel, going into some minutia and far out details, but we will do more coverage of what's actually in this uh, very, very fascinating manuscript. And thank you for the work you've done so that that's even possible for English speakers like yourself. Appreciate it. And thanks for coming on with us. You're welcome. And uh, thank you too. Take care. See you guys. Bye. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining this great podcast episode. Really appreciate it. Extra big thanks to people who are hanging out in the premiere right now, watching it live. That's always where the action's at. If you aren't somebody that does the YouTube much or Rockfin, it is fully worth your time to join us in the live shows or the premieres where you can connect to your community. That's what it's all about. It's not just about taking in the information. It's about making friends and forging alliances that will be able to carry us forward into the weird times ahead that no doubt are coming. Uh, not that I think there's doom coming. I just mean, you know, things always get weirder. That's the nature of things and stuff. <laughs> so here we go. Wanted to talk a little bit about Orlinda here in the outro. This is far from the last word on the subject. I as I alluded to at the very beginning, I've done a vibrant where we talked about some of the concepts in Orlinda. I'm gonna do more of those as we comb through the history that may be in there. I mean, there is history in there. The question is the legitimacy of the history or the accuracy of it. I'm leaning towards the idea that there's quite a lot of accuracy to the history in the Orlinda. There's also the obfuscation that's been put out there, the smoke screens of connecting it to a certain NAZI <laughs> ideologies that to me when you see that I mean that entire era seems to be a huge flag of like hey don't look at this this is the boogeyman bad 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 and so much deception around that time period I mean not to get into it too deeply but the fact is we have been conditioned as a culture to reject the idea of in-group preference with our own family ties and instead trade it for in-group preference for our political ideologies and classifications that you might call the victim Olympics. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm somebody that loves everybody, but I'm also, as I'm maturing, seeing the value of holding our own in a type of connected community where we are able to teach the things we want to teach to our children. We're able to keep out the type of ideas that we don't want to be part of our 
collective consciousness and our own units. And we are able to have freedom through independence from large systems that feed upon the, the weak. I don't want to say weak as in like in a derogatory sense, but those who have, you know, sold out their ability to fend for themselves for <laughs> universal basic income, welfare, what have you. I know I'm kind of rambling here, but I, there's some very important truths about life that seem to be contained in the Orlinda. And in particular, I hope you do check out the Vibrant episode 102, where we talked about it because we discussed the teachings of Ralda or the universal great spirit, the source. And it's beautiful and elegant how simple those teachings are, yet how much can be unpacked from them. In particular, the whole no man can stand in the same river twice idea because it's not the same river and it's not the same man. You know, can we really say I am this or I am that or I think this or I think that when the very next moment that follows you are something else and you think something else? It's an interesting position to consider that to really tap into the present moment, to really access the source and the truth of now requires a type of transcending beyond the identity structures and the egoic realm that puts us firmly in the imagination of the divine that is the ever-changing ever-flowing one life that we all share so i'm looking forward to doing more content on the orlinda would love to talk to other researchers who've looked into it and would even like to talk to jan again i didn't have as much to say in this episode in the interview because dylan had a lot that he wanted to put out there and he wanted to ask Jan about and I was happy to just watch and learn as I was newer to the subject matter at that time but now I'm starting to get my arms around it and I definitely want more and including a very high probability of asking Jan to come back and talk to him about things that I particularly find interesting after I've combed through the whole text and given it my best shot at comprehension so yeah I was I would love to uh, get your support in any way you'd like to show it you can super chat, you can get yourself a tuning ceremony. Those have been incredibly powerful. You know, we're in Virgo season right now and I noticed an immediate increase in inquiries and bookings as Virgo does seem to be the sign most correlated with health and taking care of yourself. And no surprise, lots more people started showing up to get tunings. And in, in uh, particular, I think this would be a good time to start looking at issues related to the sacral chakra, the stomach, the digestion, pent up frustration, resentment, guilt. And even as we slide further into the, uh, the Zodiac, we start getting into Libra, we start getting into Scorpio, which may be the time frame in terms of where you actually get a session booked if you donate now, because there is kind of a waiting period. That's still second chakra type stuff largely. And, you know, Libra may have more to do with a wider variety of stuff, but there's no, I guess there's no wrong time to do a tuning session, but if those are things you're particularly looking to improve on like sexual health, creativity, flow state, you know, great time to do it. I'm always learning more about the biofield in, in these sessions, which is fascinating to me that it, what I thought I had as a roadmap was actually just the bare bones and just the beginning. And so even if you've had a tuning, maybe it's been six months or a year, I would venture that I've gotten even better at it since then. And, you know, you've grown and come to open up to new things to improve upon that you're ready for. And so the work continues onward, Excelsior. <laughs> I'd like to read a, a short review of a recent tuning client that I thought was really well said. And this client says, the tuning is both a fascinating and extremely rewarding experience. Chance's passion is evident, and it's appreciated that he takes the time to walk you through the journey. The relaxed nature makes it very easy to feel comfortable being vulnerable and be open to the experience. I was stunned at the connections he was able to draw and the unconscious aspects that seemed like they were sitting just beyond my perception. The recording is really helpful to refer back to as well, so it's a much appreciated touch. Since the tuning, I've experienced a widening of the scope in what I'm able to perceive and feel and mu feeling much more grounded in my own frame. I'm extremely grateful for this experience, and if anyone is sitting on the fence, it's so extremely worth doing. So thank you for that. You know who you are. It's a great review. It's exactly what I hope to achieve by working together with sound. 
the finding those things that are in the subconscious just out of reach because in terms of the energy dynamic the things really are just right out of reach they're just off to the left or off to the right just literally following you around waiting for you to catch up to notice what you've been pushing away and projecting so i hope you guys are doing well out there check the episode description for typical new herbs you can get yourself some great supplements and medicines made with love from our buddies kyle and serena Use the Interverse coupon code for a 10% discount on those. Those are my favorite ways to be supported is typical new herbs or you come and get a tuning with me. And another thing I don't talk about uh, a lot lately, but I do offer are counseling sessions using uh, tarot cards and the I Ching. And those are also quite powerful. And the recording you get back from that, there might be a lot there you can take notes with. I just did one of those recently. And with a gentleman from Australia and we had a great time and learned a lot and had a lot of affirmations for him and a lot of good insights for his next steps in his path. Really cool stuff. So hope you're doing well out there. Love y'all. And I will catch you on the next episode and watch out for more vibrants about the Oralinda. They will be coming and I can't wait to dig in and discover more. And of course, make sure you support Jan Ott. You can subscribe to his YouTube channel. You can go to orlinda.org and the wiki there will also give you a free access to his translations and other translations of it. It's a great resource. I hope you take advantage. Other than that, have a great Virgo season. Be well, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>